we're running the great sounds of the 60s series over the next few weeks here on BBC4, starting with Freddie and the Dreamers on Blue Peter and Pinky and Perky doing the twist. Marvellous. Tomorrow at 7. On BBC4, the news from 1967 with Robert Dougal. Svetlana Stalin is hidden tonight somewhere in Switzerland after her flight from Russia via Delhi and Rome. News from Washington is that President Johnson personally ordered that she should not be taken to the United States so as to avoid straining US-Soviet relations. Our Washington correspondent, Charles Wheeler. Svetlana's first American encounter in Delhi is said to have been with a US Marine Corps guard at the front door of the embassy. This was at 10 o'clock last Monday night. The guard called a duty officer. The visitor then explained that she was Stalin's daughter and wanted asylum. Finally, she reached the ambassador, Mr. Chester Bowles, and he accepted her story. The Russian ambassador then made strong representations for Ms. Stalin's return to the government of India. And in the course of one stormy interview at the Indian External Affairs Ministry, the Indians were accused of allowing the Americans to abduct Svetlana. All this was reported back to Washington, and a prompt decision was taken to fly Svetlana out of Delhi while the administration decided what to do about her. In the end, the president decided that she should be persuaded to choose some other refuge than the United States, at least for the present. During the week, she travelled from Delhi to Rome. Early today, she flew into Geneva aboard a chartered flight, travelling under her mother's maiden name, Ali Lueva. From Geneva, Alan McGregor. Emerging from low rain clouds, the Viscount, with Svetlana Ali Lueva on board, touched down and taxied along the runway to the lane leading to a part of the airport usually reserved for freight planes. Steps were hurriedly trundled into place. Two plain clothes Swiss security officials bounded up them. They came out of the plane and down the steps with a short, stoutish, auburn-haired woman in a green raincoat. She looked tired, drawn, and rather bewildered. She smiled slightly but said nothing as reporters pushed in to ask questions. In under ten seconds, she was into the car with the two officials. It accelerated away and left the airport through a gate usually reserved for service vehicles. Swiss authorities stressed that she had not asked for political asylum, but simply temporary permission to rest. They said they were satisfied she had never indulged in political activity. This permission is valid for anything up to 12 months. Soccer and the fifth round of the FA Cup. In Liverpool, more than 60,000 people packed the Everton ground this evening mm. to see the home team beat Liverpool 1-0. Another 40,000 watched the game on closed-circuit television at Liverpool's ground. The good-humoured crowds filed into both grounds without incident. Everton's at Goodison Park was packed with a capacity of 64,000, but Tots had difficulty in selling tickets to fans who arrived late. A mile away at Liverpool's ground, over 40,000 people watched a live television relay of the match on giant screens. High winds split one, but seven remained intact. After the derby, the crowds dispersed without incident. And at the other ties, Birmingham put Arsenal out with a goal seven minutes from time, and Chelsea are through with a 2-0 win over Sheffield United. But Manchester City and Ipswich must meet again next Tuesday. The other two teams through so far, Sheffield Wednesday with a 3-1 win at Norwich, and Tottenham, who beat Bristol City 2-0. Nottingham and Swindon replay on Tuesday, and Sunderland and Leeds on Wednesday. There were two drawn games in the Scottish Cup third round, but Celtic beat Queen's Park 5-3, and Dundee had a 1-0 win over Dunfermline. The leader of the House of Commons, Mr Richard Crossman, spoke about Labour's differences of opinion when he addressed a party regional conference at Bury St Edmunds. He said that while there was talk of disagreement in the government, there was nothing more striking than the disagreement in the opposition. At the Conservative Party's local government conference in London, the leader of the opposition, Mr Edward Heath, said the votes lost by the government at this week's by-elections were protest votes against stagnation. And all the indications were that Britain was facing another two years of stagnation and siege economy. The Labour MP for Oldham West, Mr Leslie Hale, said today he had been misreported on some criticisms of the government. He had made them at a private meeting in his constituency last night when he announced his intention of retiring. A number of humorous anecdotes had been taken out of context. Well, Jim Bidoff asked Mr Hale what his plans are? Well, my plans are perfectly clear. I've said for a long time that I have been gravely ill, that my wife is not well, and that I feel the time has come when I ought to hand over, uh, or at least permit the Oldham Labour Party to have time to arrange for a successor. British military authorities in Aden 
say there's no reason for service families to keep their children at school in Britain over the Easter holidays. Only yesterday, the British High Commission advised parents to think seriously before having their children visit them. From Aden, David Tyndall reports on the situation. Troops moving into Aden's trouble centre, the Crater District, have been given orders to shoot any suspected terrorist who refuses to stop after two warning calls in Arabic. But it isn't usually until a grenade is thrown that the patrols have the slightest clue as to the enemy's whereabouts. Their favourite vantage points for lobbing missiles at the troops are the rooftops, and in this shantytown territory, they've got plenty of choice. By now, the soldiers know that as soon as they see a grenade is being hurled in their direction, they have no more than a couple of seconds to lie flat on their faces. If they do this, then, more often than not, they're safe, because the blast from these grenades invariably goes upwards, roughly in the shape of a cone. With the latest terrorist attacks in this teeming Arab area, the army now makes their patrols two platoons strong, about 50 men in all. It takes the patrol just over an hour to cover the district quickly, and during that time, there's rarely need for a single word of command. Each man knows what he must do, and the possible consequences should he forget. The Armenian manuscripts, which were to be auctioned in London, are on their way back to Jerusalem. Wrapped in brown paper, the 23 volumes were handed over at Sotheby's this morning. Lord John Carr, a director of Sotheby's, returned the manuscripts after a personal appeal from the Patriarch of Jerusalem. The books, worth as much as half a million pounds, left London Airport with Bishop Ajemian. Jim Bidolf asked the bishop if he knew their seller's identity. Uh, well, I, I think so. Are you prepared to so. disclose uh, who that is? Uh, the Armenian Patriarch will issue an official statement about all the matter uh, during the next week, and it will be sent to all the newspapers, uh, officially signed by the Patriarch. Um, you well, you will not believe yes. 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 Thank you. I thank you again. The executive of West Germany's extreme right-wing party, the NPD, confirmed tonight that they've decided to unseat their chairman, Fritz Thielen. He's been regarded as a moderate in NPD terms. Orders Herr Thielen made, expelling eight far-right party members, including Adolf von Tudden, the deputy chairman, were revoked by tonight's executive meeting. Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden are now in Nassau for their holiday in the Bahamas. They'll be staying there for nine days. The princess was reunited with her husband at New York's Kennedy Airport after being parted for six weeks while Lord Snowden was working in Japan and America. It was during Lord Snowden's absence that rumours began of a rift in their seven-year-old marriage. They were strongly denied by Lord Snowden. The couple posed for photographs, but reporters, hoping for an informal news conference, were disappointed. China. The Peking government has expelled two Russian diplomats, accusing them of political persecution of Chinese employees at the Soviet embassy. And in another incident, China claims that when the Peking Moscow train arrived in the Soviet Union last month, the Russians confiscated over 200 volumes of Chairman Mao's writings. A strong Chinese protest note claimed the books were removed on the orders of the Russian government and hadn't been returned. Vietnam. American bombers from Thailand have again raided the North's biggest steelworks. All the planes are reported to have returned. But today, the Americans released film of how many pilots are saved after being shot down. A Sky Raider fighter goes in first to give covering fire. A helicopter is guided to the clearing where the pilot's waiting and a member of the crew is winched down on a lifeline to bring him up. The whole rescue is controlled from a recovery centre miles away in Saigon. Helicopters often spend hours flying high above the jungle, waiting for the coded signal that tells them they're needed. And the Defence Department says that many pilots have been saved from right under the rifles of the enemy. India's Prime Minister, Mrs Indira Gandhi, has announced that former Finance Minister Moraji Desai has agreed to call off his bid for the Indian Premiership. He'll be given a senior cabinet portfolio and Mrs. Gandhi said he had pledged her his unqualified support. Mrs. Gandhi was first challenged by Mr. Desai in the Indian leadership crisis last year. She'll be formally re-elected tomorrow. A big police hunt is still going on in East Anglia after the murder early today of a farmer at Outwell near Wisbeach. A gang wearing stocking masks and armed with a shotgun broke into the house belonging to the farmer, 60-year-old Mr. John Orger, and they stole a safe. They tied him up and he was later found dead in his garden. Police said there had been considerable violence. The farmer's wife, who's 59, was also bound and gagged, but not injured. 
Police say they want to interview three men, all in their 20s and slimly built. They have a strong local accent. Rescue teams are working tonight to reach a potholer who fell over 200 feet down a mine shaft near Colford in Gloucestershire. His companion got back to the surface and alerted the police. It's expected the rescue attempt will last several hours. Cricket and a Bridgetown, the rest of the world team beat Barbados by 262 runs on the fourth day of their five-day match. The scores, rest of the world, 308 and 276, Barbados, 84 and 238. Rugby in today's international at Cardiff Arms Park, Ireland beat Wales by three points to nil. The Irish try by wing three-quarter Duggan came in the first three minutes. Peter West, the commentator. So it's Ireland's ball, and Roger Young, dental student from the north, with his old sparring partner today, his Lions sparring partner as well, the great Mike Gibson. That's a nice heel. Good strike by Ken Kennedy. Here goes Gibson coming in. Oh, I say, look at Gibson! My word, and he bounces into Brown Price, and it's another good possession. Good ball here. Jerry Walsh to kick for his win. Is it a try for Ireland, is it? Yes, it's a try! And that was the final score, 3-0, and that's all from us tonight. Now here's the weather, and good night. America will never seek a permission slip to defend the security of our country. They think every girl dressed like this might be a suicide bomber. Open your eyes to the world. A unique global view of the news, weeknights at 8 on BBC4. What if you cared more about your country than your own life? Loved your leader more than your own family? And dedicated your life to proving it? What if everyone you knew felt exactly the same way? Discover what the mass games mean to the people of North Korea. A State of Mind, Monday at 9 on BBC4. BBC Four on the first night of our massive 60s season running through June with a hard-hitting omnibus from 1968 from Tony Palmer's with scenes you may find disturbing and strobe lighting effects all my loving even those who've never seen it know that television in the 1960s was better than it is now television did then did more kinds of things some of them, I dare say, were not very good, but some of them were not bad. Perhaps the best there's ever been. I mean, my first television player, Night Out, was actually, I believe it was watched by 20 million people. For three decades, programme makers and politicians have insisted that shows such as Civilization, Kathy Come Home, Dad's Army and the Wednesday Play were a zenith of creativity. I think I had the sense of something new happening. Uh, I think there's a feeling of great energy, you know, and purpose. But are we guilty of false memory syndrome? This looks like a 1960s house. It was in fact created by Lawrence Crowellen Bowen for a TV series as recently as 2002. So was the reality of the 60s different from the memory? Good morning, good morning. We've danced the whole night through. Good morning, good morning to you. This documentary examines whether the golden age truly existed and might hold lessons for making TV today, or whether it's a smug cultural myth perpetuated by nostalgics and the artistic and political enemies of television now. Welcome to my world. A decade which would become connected with change began with continuity. The Tory party in power for a third term. In his New Year address, Pope John XXIII warned that television encouraged sin. Most viewers ignored the warning, not because TV was naughty, but because it was new. The television service programme, Alexander Paris. This afternoon, our programme includes a marionette show. At this stage, the question was less whether television was doing good work than whether the set worked at all. The first real TV stars were the engineers. What we had in those days was a very basic type of technology that had been adapted from wartime development of things like radar and so on. It come an easy to you then, this uh, television laugh. Oh, yes, it's not a bother. It's like I say, it's just a question of what you're doing. 
and these sets were well built but of course they had to withstand the rigors of quite a range of voltages in those days you know we actually were working inside of these units it was quite dangerous and I, I think I can remember a couple of times I was uh, working on the TV in one corner of the room and I would end up the other side because I'd had a, a charge from, from inside the TV. As the 60s began, television, like most other things in Britain, felt rationed. Just two channels transmitted, mainly in the evening, shows which were usually live. Thank you. The thrill that now surrounds big televised football matches, the sight of people in towns rushing home to see the start, applied in the 60s to drama. What on earth are you doing in a horse? Take it off this minute. It was the first time, I think, that there was anything like a popular culture, which in some ways involved the theatre. You know, and millions of people watched these plays, and, and um, they, they were, I think, the best we could do. I, I can't imagine... A, such a thing being possible on television now. Ready now. There are at least four or five plays on television every week. You know, that's television drama. Of course, it was all studio drama. That made it even more exciting, really. With no recording technology, audience and actors got only one chance. The cast took the precaution of lengthy preparations. The rehearsals made no sense to me at all because they were in a, a large room and things were on, in chalk on the floor. And I didn't, never knew what they meant, in fact. And then we went into the set and there were these uh, walls. Um, the actors had to run sort of behind the walls and appear bob up in front of uh, um, the camera in one place and then they would dash around a corner and bob up in another place. It, was, it, it seemed a frenzy, actually, to watch. Terrifying. And the uh, actors who saw them when they weren't on uh, camera were actually shaking with, with terror, as indeed was I. <laughs> There's a legend of an actor who died during a live TV drama. The rest of the cast paraphrased his part while the corpse was dragged out. Now most shows are recorded to avoid trouble. Then they simply have to take chances and accept accidents. John, come on. Would you mind going back? There's just one tiny thing to be done. My entrance is one of the high spots of the show so far. <laughs> but in a climate where anything could happen, there was inevitable debate about whether it was better to make one kind of programme than another. Not for the last time in television history, a definition of public service broadcasting struggled with the need to make programmes the public might actually watch. TV was the first true mass medium, but BBC executives were picky about who they wanted making and watching the shows. There's a straightforward clash here. I'd rather have a discussion. But I think a uh, discussion later, certainly. But today, we do need a short talk. It was both, um, I suppose, a bit inevitably a bit cliquish. Um, it was a bit like a publishing house in those days, I think, when the publisher or an editor would phone you up and, uh, and suggest a book, or would suggest what your next book was. It was more like a publishing house, I think, come to think of it, than a, a, a public broadcasting company. Yes, I quite agree. Well, uh, well, uh, well, there, were, there was lots of, of, of bad work. We had one producer who produced a program called Colette, and I discovered too late that he couldn't speak any French, and I thought the program Colette needed some knowledge of French. <laughs> But ITV knew how to enthuse viewers. Good evening, friends, and welcome to Double Your Money. All the top 20 shows in the ratings chart were theirs. However, the commercial channel also had Rethian dreams of its own. And now, for your Sunday night dramatic entertainment, we bring you Armchair Theatre. Serious and daring commissions could win big ratings. Armchair Theatre produced by the commercial company ATV, made a huge contribution to British drama. After the stage failure of the birthday party, Harold Pinter was saved by TV. I was pretty broke at the beginning of the 60s, and um, I was asked to go and see a man called Peter Wills, the head of drama of Associated Rediffusion. And he said, 
How dare you? I haven't had a wink of sleep for three nights. I said, I don't understand what you're saying. And he said, your bloody play, the birthday party, you wrote it, didn't you? I said, yes, I wrote it. He said, well, it's kept me awake for three nights. How outrageous. And he said, oh, well, I suppose we'd better do it. Who do you want to direct it? And I couldn't believe my ears. And he said, I want to go into production in three weeks. <laughs> and to do it the birthday party on television in 1960, was a really rather extraordinary thing to do. I mean, the play had been a total disaster two years earlier. Having turned Pinter's play from stage flop into TV hit, ITV's Sidney Newman now commissioned his first original TV script, A Night Out. He said, let me give you a, a bit of advice, Harold. He said, um, you've got to hit them in the first 30 seconds. Hit the audience, bang, like that. So I said, I see. OK, I'll bear that in mind. And I then went on to write the most boring, mundane opening of any television play that's ever been, of a young man looking, asking his mother where she put his tie. Look, Mum, where's my tie? The blue one, the blue tie, where is it? But when I gave him the, the script, I remember, he, he looked at the first, I said, I've, I've hit it, I've started the play with the bang that you asked for, um, a young man looking for his tie, and he said, you bastard. <laughs> what do you want your tie for? I want to put it on. I asked you to press it for me this morning. Well, but though its opening out? moments broke the rules, the play, with the news that 20 million viewers had tuned in, certainly ended in a hit. I've cooked for you, especially for you, at Shepherd's Pie. <laughs> when Sidney Newman found out that a night out could top the ratings, he was, he was very, very moved and very gratified. He could hardly believe it. The BBC now realised that with plays such as A Night Out, ITV had created a bold new idea of a night in. If ITV could draw huge audiences for a script in daring dialogue by an unknown writer, distinctions between commercial and public service broadcasting were breaking down. New BBC Director General Hugh Green re-examined the BBC's elitism. Hugh Green was a charismatic leader uh, and his contribution to the BBC through the 60s was massive yeah, and distinctive. Uh, and it was Hugh who was the competitor of all times and who encouraged us to compete. The BBC share of the audience had gone down in the late 50s to barely more than a quarter. And something clearly had to be done about that. Taking a hint from the Pinter success, Green poached Sidney Newman. The BBC drama was still catering to a highly educated, cultured class rather than uh, the mass audience, which was not aware of culture uh, as such and had no real background. Newman created the Wednesday play, finding writers such as Dennis Potter and David Mercer and two classic working class dramas, Jeremy Sanford's Cathy Come Home and Nell Dunn's Up the Junction. Why don't you tell them about that woman that came round last night? What, that old crab from the W? Yeah. <clears throat> well, she comes round, you see, to tell us what to do if they're going to drop the H bomb on us. First of all, she says, fill your bath with water. We ain't got no bath, well, I said. That put right in a place, yeah. didn't it? Well, uh, Sidney Newman's move to the BBC was a measure of the power an individual producer had. Another was that having been poached by senior management, a producer was subsequently almost never grilled. Producers then had almost complete creative freedom. There was no interference by controllers. I mean, not the sort of in the interference that there is now. I mean, it would be unheard of, unheard of for a controller to ask for a read-through of something before making up their mind. I would like, however, to go back to something we were talking about last week. I've been having second thoughts about this. That's not a controller's job to be deciding in detail what programmes are. I mean, you, as a producer, you didn't have um, four or five people second-guessing you from, at every stage. You had people who were supportive, and you certainly had people who had opinions. Um, but on the whole, you were left to your own devices. Some of the people who criticised television in the 60s, 70s, they say that programme makers were making programmes for themselves, not caring about the audience. Was that the case? Of course there's truth in that. But if programme makers aren't making programmes that they want to see themselves, they're in the wrong job. Uh, they become uh, cynical, uh, purveyors, mechanical purveyors of formula stuff. You make programmes because you think the subject matter is fascinating, or because you've got a marvellous idea which you want to express, and you want to communicate with people. 
of course uh, people have to make programs for themselves um, and if they if they uh, meet an audience that's that is receptive to them fine they're in business but if they make program for themselves that nobody else wants to see then they just get out of the job that's what you do except not from the bbc nobody ever got fired from the bbc they called it the right to fail and sometimes they did the absurdist writer eugene ionesco was hired to work with harold pinter and samuel beckett on an experimental trilogy I knew it was going to go down the drain as a, as a, as a three-part venture when Ionesco was asked what his was going to be, what he had in mind. And he said, the first thing I see, he said this in French, but nevertheless, uh, he said, um, first thing I see is a, a, a hilltop full of sheep, and then I want all the sheep to die. It, it, he said, and we said, how, how, is he, how are they going to die? He said, flamethrowers, they're all burnt to death. And I thought, this isn't going to work out. There was such freedom, I think that's the word I've been looking for. Um, it, it didn't quite extend to burnt sheep on mountaintops, but nevertheless there was real freedom of movement in the, in the medium. Right, stand by for a take, please. The 60s favoured studio-based single plays, partly because of a cultural respect for theatre, but also crucially because it was too difficult and expensive to shoot film drama on location. So, as often in this period, what looks like a creative decision was actually a technical one. Content is a result of the available technology. When the BBC hosted its first live transmission from Russia, there was no particular editorial imperative. They did so not because they should, but because they could. We had gone to Moscow to prepare a program, a, a panorama program for May the 1st, just happened to be in Moscow on the day of Gagarin's space flight, uh, and a couple of us got together uh, and did our best to organize a live link with Moscow, uh, which certainly wasn't due for another six months or so. The arrival of the hero in Moscow. Yuri Gagarin. Alone, nobody with him. It was a fluke that we ever managed to get that on the air. But it was a historic fluke, because it was the first time that you saw live pictures from Moscow. And of course, in those days, live pictures from anywhere outside England was regarded as something quite historic. The man. But often there was more excitement about the way they were putting it out than what they were putting in. They have acquired the Telstar, and Captain Booth puts his thumb up. We can punch you the picture. And there is the picture, direct from Telstar. While Techies Inside TV cheered the transmission of a white rectangle across space, engineers in the outside world still struggled to beam pictures across Britain. Ah, there she is. In those days, TVs, well, they were very unreliable. Oh, no, not again. Oh, no. If the TV went down, if they lost picture, or sound or anything wrong. I mean, you had to get there that day. You mean you watch it every night? Of course, every programme, certainly. Yeah, they couldn't do without it. You can do without it for one night, can't you? But of course I can't. They were relieved, the fact that you, you, turned, out, you turned out, and they were not very happy if you say, well, I'm sorry, this really needs to go back to the workshop. Come on, Bernard. No, please don't take it away. You can't leave me alone, please. You can't take the word telly away, please. <laughs> Ignoring these hints that the system was struggling to keep two channels on air, the BBC in 1964 introduced a third option. Recent celebrations of the 40th anniversary of BBC Two have presented the triumph over a power cut on the first night as a brief blip in the birth of a cherished new service. Good evening. This is BBC Two. But as often in 60s television, the reality is much worse than is generally remembered. For once, the pictures proved entirely sound, but the sound didn't. There was a power failure, yes. I think it was not the BBC's fault, I think it was the electricity board. Well, good evening. And as I said a few minutes ago, and I understand nobody could hear me, welcome to BBC Two. Excuse me, just like Channel One. Hello? 
Unlike Channel One, there's nobody there. They only had um, the one chance, uh, and you couldn't bring the curtain down and apologise and say, we'll start again in a minute. You know, it was, there, there, there was the moment, and it had gone, and it could, it could have been, every evening could have been a catastrophe, actually. Um, some tape handed to me now. Widespread electricity failures reported in London tonight. The power failure halted underground trains. Let's try again. Hello? For the time being. Excuse me. Yes? Right. Yes. We are going to repeat this news summary in one minute. As happened recently with the addition of BBC Three and BBC Four to television, the expansion in programming initially irritated viewers who in one sense or another didn't get it. I was furious to discover that we are unable to pick up BBC Two. Surely the best of television should go out to the majority of people on BBC One and not to the chosen few on BBC Two. It had big problems because um, it had to have a completely new set of transmitters and so to begin with, you could only see it in London and then later Birmingham. It took several years to spread across the country. But you had to have a new set. Some of the sets that first came out were what we called dual standard, which meant they worked on 405 and 625 lines. They needed a tuner so they could switch from BBC to ITV. And there were huge, great clanking sets. Where you had a great knob that went clunk and it moved from 405 lines to 65 lines. And this was quite a remarkable piece of kit that one was dealing with. Though BBC Two soon managed to transmit pictures and sound successfully, many viewers remained as irritated by their presence as their absence. The BBC called in an expert on evolution. Quite honestly, the only people who've been going around saying that BBC Two is a failure, as far as I've discovered, are the people who've never seen it. The uh, programme policy uh, which I uh, proposed, and I didn't propose it to anybody, I just simply adopted it. I said that BBC Two was not in the business of producing carbon copies of any other network's programmes. Everything we would do would be identifiably different in some significant way. When we were little, we all went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle. We used to call him Tortoise. Why did you call him Tortoise if he wasn't one? We called him Tortoise because he taught us. Really, you are very dull. The only thing we wouldn't do, I said in a rather toffee nose way, we will not do mindless television. That was the only thing I said. And what did you define as mindless television? Sort of visual chewing gum. It didn't really matter whether you watched it. I mean, quizzes and, you know, uh, fairly mindless stuff. In fact, though cheerleaders for the period keep quiet about this, the other channels held as much chewing gum as the underside of a bus seat. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another game of Quiz Bingo. <laughs> and we have Linda. Linda is a student physio young lady that manipulates all sorts of things, don't you, darling? Hello and welcome to Mainly for Men, and as the title implies, this is a programme, fellas, just for you. And a few delectable damsels scattered all over the place. Now, take this one. She's not the moving variety, but she is a very famous young lady called Venus de Milo. Uh, a little bit plump for me, although she had a few Romans getting a bit hot under the old toga round about uh, the fourth century. I wonder, uh, just, has anybody in the audience a question for Robert Morley? I feel the sort of person that you're all I'm longing to ask him a question. I've got whole thousands here. Is there any one person in the audience there that has a question for him? Quite obviously, they haven't plotted him. No, oh, we don't. <laughs> any one person? Come on. Oh, now look. One. One. <laughs> So far, TV had changed faster than the society around it, until 1964, when youth gangs clashed, music set new records for popularity, and Mary Quant tore up the pattern of fashion. The general election of that year also dramatised the sense of a fight between two ideas of Britain. That, Mr Chairman, is our aim in this election to restore that sense of social purpose which was once created in this country and which we have lost. Harold Wilson, a technocrat, 
challenged Alec Douglas Hume, an aristocrat whose rhetoric invoked the past. I thought that one of the marks of democracy in this country was that we were allowed to hear the other party's case. Well, I'm going on speaking so that everybody hears whether they like it or not. British politicians had tended to be doubly ignorant of television. They didn't watch it and they didn't much want to be on it. Churchill's rhetorical triumphs had been on the wireless. Alec Douglas Hume, told by a BBC makeup lady that he had a head like a skull, also favoured radio. But in 1964, the country elected its first TV literate PM, who, though he came to hate the medium, at first loved it. He really thought that television was the way to win the elections. He recognised that it was the one way, as he said to me, he could get into every uh, sitting room, even of those houses that didn't take a daily newspaper or took the wrong one, as he saw it. I'm in the crowd. Uh, same goes for me. Thank you very much for giving us this silver heart. But I still think you should, should have given one to good old Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Wilson had an instinctive understanding of who to be seen with to get on television and at first also got on with those who ran TV. But the BBC helped him quite a bit to win his general election in 1964 thanks to some small scheduling uh, on polling night. Steptoe and Son, which was then enormously popular, was scheduled to go out at 8 o'clock. And Wilson felt, possibly rightly, that this would keep Labour voters at home. And he went to see Hugh Green and said to Hugh Green, I think this is wrong, blah, blah, blah. It ought to be moved. And Hugh Green decided to schedule it at 9 o'clock, by which time the polls had closed. Well, look, Dad, I was desperate for money. You took advantage of me. I didn't. You... The BBC actually claims to have helped you win an election by delaying an episode of Steptoe and Son on election night. Did they? Well, if they gave us any help, it was inadvertent, and I don't remember it. I'm sorry, Harold. It's the principle of the thing. When you sell your chance, you sell it. I'm in with the in crowd. I go where the in crowd goes. I'm in with the in crowd. Well, Wilson always thought that he had a good relationship with television producers and television interviewers. Now, that worked very well while he was leader of the opposition. He thought he could continue that when he was Prime Minister, and of course didn't realise that it was a totally different relationship from that moment onwards. Although Wilson is described as TV friendly, he had crucially grown up at a time when television was friendly to politicians. What are your immediate plans, Stratley? My immediate plans are to go down to a committee to decide on just that thing, as soon as I can get away from here. Um, anything else you care to say about the coming election? No. Uh, the BBC political correspondent in those days never gave his own opinion. He never um, had the cynical aside or the satirical joke. He did a straightforward reporting job. While it had not yet affected journalism, a different relationship between politicians and TV had been sketched out by a now famous 60s satire show. is marginal. <laughs> don't think of Wilson as a mere commodity. You don't use Wilson. Wilson uses you. It was an attack on the body politic, you see, and it was effective. I mean, there hasn't been a, I'm sure, a late night, Saturday late night program that pulled in as many people as that was the week that was. On the one hand, Lord Hume, and on the other hand, Mr. Harold Wilson. Dull Alec versus Smart Alec. Do you know that I used to write sketches for That Was The Week That Was? And uh, I was sitting with Harold in his study one day with Tony Benn, and they were talking about the disgraceful program, how terrible it had been. And Ben said the worst of all the programs was an attack they did on Henry Brook, who had been the Tory Home Secretary. Of all the many tributes that have been paid to you for your work on behalf of your fellow man, perhaps the best known and most sincere came from Mr. Marcus Lipton, MP for Brixton. You are the most hated man in Britain. And they both agreed that this was reached new depths in 
British television. I sat there knowing that I'd written most of the script. I didn't say a word. Your policy, Mr. Brooke, has been one of trial and error. Their trials, your errors. And so... TW3 lasted for only two years, but gave political interviewers courage, as Wilson's deputy George Brown found out, to start a new day. It's a little difficult being interviewed down the line. I hope you don't take it personally. Not a bit, Mr. Day. I like you immensely, but you must understand the rules by which we do this. May I call you brother? If you wish, Thank I would be very flattered and delighted. Goodbye, Mr. Brown. Goodbye, Brother Day. Robin Day, I think, was very good. And the reason was that Robin knew his politics. I mean, he had been a, a liberal candidate, and the way to get under his skin was to remind him of it. Uh, but he, he loved politics, he understood politics, he knew politicians, uh, he didn't seek to ingratiate himself, and uh, he was very, very good. You've been described as hard-hitting and belligerent. What are your reactions to these kind of criticisms of your reporting? Um, well, I think they're largely the result of people taking offence at questions to someone whom they support. Yes, but your directness is very often taken for rudeness, and I wonder if the directness doesn't often antagonise the person that you are interviewing. Well, when you say it's very often taken for rudeness, what is your evidence for that? But you know, most... Do you think, can, can I say I this, Robin? That, Prime Minister, but how long do you think that a government on our system can cling to office in defiance of the people's wishes as they appear well, without uh, damaging our system, without damaging confidence in the way the system works? Is there not abundant evidence from the by-elections, the local elections and the opinion polls that the majority of the people of this country are fed up with both you and your government? No. Give me an F! <laughs> Give me a U! <laughs> Give me a C! <laughs> Give me a K! <laughs> What's that spell? This sense of liberation still had limits. In 1965, on the late-night show BBC Three, Critic Kenneth Tynan said he doubted if many people were shocked by the word fuck anymore. He was wrong. Many were horrified. <laughs> that wasn't in the script. <laughs> Drama is one thing, but uh, real uh, uh, conversational television is another thing. No, undoubtedly it, it created a shockwave, yes. Yes, I think he was rather daunted. I mean, furious people threatening to come and shoot him and Prime Minister's getting up and complaining. I think it seemed a little much. Further demonstrating the gap between politics and television, one MP called for Tynan's hanging. The BBC hung its head. Although the BBC apologised for Tynan's word, they pointed out that it had been used in its correct sexual context. Uh, Your Honour, I want to ask this witness to relate what was stated. There are some profane words. But so volatile was 60s morality that by the end of the decade there was far less reaction to a much stronger word used in an American legal reconstruction. If you remember the Chicago conspiracy trial, the various people at Kent University had been goaded in, into using violence and one of the words used was motherfucker. Would you relate what you heard the defendant Rubin say? He looked over his shoulder at the police and he says, look at these motherfucking pigs. He said, they have to be standing here in the park, protecting the park, and the park belongs to the people. Now, when Paul Fox saw this in the script, he phoned me and says, this is a Sunday, 8 to 11. So I then explained that this was an absolutely trigger word which, which created the violence, and it was absolutely essential to retain it. He saw this immediately, it went out, and there wasn't a single complaint at the time. It is an illustrative of the kind of freedom we, we had. Such liberal linguistic niceties were fine in the BBC common room, but there was a different view in one staff room. Mrs Mary Whitehouse, a Midlands teacher, who had declared herself television censor, believed that the comedy and entertainment schedules of the BBC were driven by a desire to liberalise through filth. Last Thursday evening, we sat as a family and we saw a programme that started at 6.35. How often do you get an orgasm? <sighs> and it was the dirtiest programme that I have seen for a very long time. <gasps> uh, not every time, but um, quite often. <laughs> Numerous people said to me, I resent television bringing into my home behaviour that I would never accept and never have, and my family would never have. Did you take her seriously at all as a programme conjurer? 
Well, I did. Um, the Director General, Hugh Green, purported to dismiss her. Um, I refused to see her, and uh, I think that was right. It would have only given her publicity. Maybe Hugh Green was too tough on her uh, and not sufficiently uh, sensible in at least asking her to come to Broadcasting House once and have one interview with her. He dismissed her out of hand, and of course that enraged her. And she became, I'm not saying more powerful, but she had greater influence as a result of being banned by the BBC. Mrs. Mary Warner! Yeah. What's the clean-up TV woman? What's that old? There's a that woman. <laughs> that woman is concerned for the moral welfare of your country, isn't she? She disliked it intensely. And the more she disliked it, the more she said that she disliked it, the more viewers we got. She was a kind of litmus paper of public opinion, in reverse. I think there was a lot of problems about the morality of television programmes in the 60s because television was only doing its job. It was actually showing the diverse currents in a society which was changing very fast. A lot of the established certainties of, of society were beginning to break down. The idea that you went to church on Sundays, the idea that you didn't have sex before marriage and those kind of things. Have you met any pop groups before? Yes. And what happened? I met the drummer out of Jeff Beck, went with Titch out of Dave D, and with all the, um, um, <laughs> so television was dealing with social changes, changes in morality, and it got a lot of stick from the more right-wing lobbies. Mrs Whitehouse was largely obsessed with sex and with the BBC. She almost never criticised commercial television. But in retrospect, her secondary target of violence looks the more significant. Oh, and it was ITV which in 1969 became the first British broadcaster to cancel a drama in mid-series because of complaints over violence. If the expression had existed then, Big Bread when a hog would have been called in your face. Everybody in this was a gangster. Everybody was absolutely corrupt. But they did have one, one program, it was an hour long, where the last 20 minutes was a kind of escalating series of violent attacks and revenges. No. Get away from me! This is my night. Got everything? Yep. Sulfuric? No, spirit of salt. What we use on those brass lamps. They melted. Nobody hits Hulk. I think television was really finding its way with violence and it was really suggesting an awful lot. There was a real obsession with crime and low life, this underworld that for the first time was in people's living rooms that really made television violence in the 1960s a very powerful thing. The airwaves tried to respond to the revolution in music, but still had problems with the means of production. Oh, here we go again. Sometimes the signal wasn't that good. One used to get certain things like snow effect and sparkles and so on. The most common one is that the area would have been blown around by the wind, so people were in a bit of a dip or something and were behind the leeward side of a hill. You know, we need a bigger area. Aerial installation was a dangerous job because, of course, people had to go up onto roofs, onto slippery tiles, and one had heard, of course, of various accidents where people did fall off roofs and injure themselves quite seriously. <laughs> we think of cable TV as modern, but Rediffusion used it then to get round bad reception. It offered consumers no the chance to get a good reception where they couldn't get a reception at all. They had community TV as well, which used to go out, I think, late at night. 
Right, that's the end of the news. And now I'd like to introduce a local poet, Molly Monkton, who lives in Blackheath, who will recite her poem, uh, Old Inhabitants Ode to Blackheath Fair. This, of course, gave access to a lot of people, regardless of the quality. What's that wild music? What can it be? It's only the fair, dear, of Blackheath, S.E. For many a year, decade, dead and gone, that fair has come here and is still carrying on. It could be camera one, yeah, it was on a slide. As television transmitters and sets spread around the country, the show set out across the world. International interest in the coronation in the 50s had given TV an interest in building its own empire through globe-linking shows including Miss World and the Eurovision Song Contest. Such international access shows have many modern equivalents, but more surprisingly, the 60s archive also holds an early example of reality TV. Over three days, there were live broadcasts from one of Scotland's toughest mountains as climbers took on the old man of Hoy. Big audiences tuned in to see if it ever became, I'm a casualty, get me off here. I've got to somehow turn round here, and I've only got a rather bad ham jam, it's right inside the crack, and I've got to swing right out, it's quite hairy, if he moves by the look of it. There is literally nothing between us and the ground. Right, there are. And that's it, it's great being up. But, like mountaineers, television often attempted a challenge to test the equipment rather than from intellectual conviction. When satellites brought the global TV audience together in our world, they didn't necessarily have much to say. This is Magnus Magnusson reporting from the prize-winning new town of Cumbernauld. A whole world away from the crowds and the noise and the dirt that they knew in Glasgow, the new people of the new town enjoy the best of city as well as village life. Although these high-tech projects often lack content, they were driven by a perception of the potential audience as television expanded. In the mid-60s, the term ratings war was used for the first time. But the BBC now faced what would become a recurrent historical dilemma. Should it ignore or embrace the market? The judgments were delicate. BBC One and Two combined had to get a reasonable share, either between 60 and 40% of the audience compared with ITV. If we got only 40%, the two of us together, our view was, well, look here, we can't allow it that slip that far. But equally, if we got 60%, we say, now look, you know, this is too much. We're not, we're not trying enough. We're not being experimental enough. We're not uh, risking enough. Um, and, and, and they will respond by going farther down market if we're not too careful. So we kept it between 40 and 60 quite deliberately. I remember when Doctor Who, because Doctor Who got into the top 20 and um, was in some ways, it was rather frowned upon <laughs> that we had done so well. Remember the format? Yeah. We watched the ratings very carefully, but we didn't always take enormous notice from them. Let me give you a, a sort of notorious example. We produced all of Samuel Beckett's plays, and you do know the erection index for a David Attenborough show would be somewhere in the 90s out of 100. Well, Crap's last tape got an uh, a rating of 16, and there was a lo long silence at the uh, program review board until uh, Hugh Weldon said, that proves that Samuel Beckett is a genius, and that was the end of the discussion. <laughs> Halfway through the decade, tape shows became possible. This should have given the medium a permanence to rival cinema, but because recording was initially so rare and costly, these programmes just suffered from a different kind of disposability. Well, we were taping on Doctor Who. We did tape. But I think they probably... Well, they have wiped a lot. They wiped a lot of, a lot of stuff. I think the BBC must be tearing its hair out, really, about the amount of stuff that they wiped. Stage dramatists accept that their work vanishes, but Simon Gray lost a decade to TV plays. 
I remember on discovering, the, uh, discovering that they'd all been wiped, I was very distressed. Um, because none of the none of one's early work, so to speak, had survived. In fact, a single clip of one of the plays exists on a review show. My wife does not own a transparent nightgown. She would not own such a thing. <laughs> I trapped you there, I think. <laughs> yes, yes, yes! I lied. I would touch her, the old bag. All art is Darwinist. The strongest work survives while the weakest disappears. And the history of television is written by what remains on tape. The fact that the reels required to record one program filled the space of a large suitcase has helped to romanticise the programming of the 1960s. Most of the stuff that people couldn't believe they were seeing can no longer be seen to be disbelieved. By 1966, Mary Quant, who had challenged the establishment, joined it with an OBE. The group, which had become the cultural brand name of the decade, stopped playing live. And perhaps sensing a slowing down in the decade's energy, Wilson called a snap election, hoping to expand his marginal majority. The Prime Minister was by now so box-conscious that he installed a TV studio in the train, bringing him from his Liverpool constituency to London after his re-election. This is the train coming into Platform 3 at Euston Station bearing a triumphant Harold Wilson. It's entirely likely that Harold Wilson... But the plan went off track when the wrong signals were sent. John Morgan, the BBC reporter on board, was asked by Wilson to remember his duty to the government. When he replied that he would remember his duty to journalism, the PM refused to speak to the BBC. The telefriendly politician had switched off. Well, all we have from Mr Wilson is that he will be making a statement later. It now appears that we're going into the era of slightly less talking than the last three weeks. When you get in for a second term, well, then things look a bit different. You think, well, there's really seditious things going on here. And certainly Wilson had it in for us. Many people who've written about Harold Wilson's attitude towards television, towards BBC, have used the word paranoid. Yeah, well, the, the old saying is you can be... He may be paranoid, but he had a lot to be paranoid about. And uh, in particular, the, he thought that the BBC had its own agenda. Wilson alleged that we tried to get him into a confrontation with Ted Heath. Well, certainly, we wanted to. I mean, it would have been ideal. It was done in America all the time, that the two uh, principal candidates met each other face to face. Uh, Wilson refused to do it, Ted Heath wanted to do it, and from that moment on, Wilson was suspicious of us. Then, as now, a government's main hold over the BBC was the choice of chairman. The PM sent in Lord Hill, the former radio doctor, who was a Wilson friend and, just as importantly, an ITV man. It was a deliberate poke in the eye, I'm sure, uh, for Hugh Green, by our personal spite by, by Harold Wilson. I had many letters of congratulation, but not one, uh, not message of any kind from the BBC or anybody there. Oh, I don't know how far you want me to go in this, but it was a pretty chilly reception. He, I'm sure, thought of himself as kind of BBC man and was astounded to see that the BBC uh, management disliked him. I mean, they were absurdly hostile to him, and I was summoned. And, and I went to see him, and the, he, uh, he had this very portentous voice. He said, um, well, now, David, um, I've not been very welcomed here, you know. Uh, I wonder why that would be. And I said, well, uh, Chairman, um, uh, the thing is that um, you've got to remember that you were leader of the opposition uh, the, to the BBC, and it's as though people in the Eighth Army woke up one morning and were suddenly told that, uh, although they thought they'd been winning the war with Monty, they had now got Rommel as a general. A year after Hill's arrival, Hugh Green resigned as Director General, leaving rich soil for conspiracies. Did he dig his own grave with a liberal agenda? Or was he uprooted by Wilson's plant in the chairman's office? Whatever the reason, his modernising agenda was buried. I think you know, that when one's been in a job like this for such a long time, there's bound to come a time when one feels 
one's given one's best to it. Ex-director generals are soon forgotten, but we have recently had cause to remember Green. It's a story we think we know well. A young, fresh-thinking Labour leader, elected to end more than a decade of Tory rule, who during a period when he's under pressure to support a controversial American war, becomes convinced that the BBC is deliberately hostile to him and starts an argument which leads to the downfall of senior BBC management. But for Tony Blair, Iraq and Greg Dyke, substitute Harold Wilson, Vietnam and Hugh Carlton Green. Those commentators who described the recent dispute between government and broadcasters around the Hutton Report as unprecedented are forgetting the television of the 1960s. This is the BBC television service. We now present from Studio A, Alexandra Palace, another programme in our series of experimental transmissions in colour. Throughout the decade, television's ambition for the picture it wanted to give viewers had been ahead of the equipment. The coming of colour in 1967, for which BBC Two 625 lines had been designed, fulfilled a great dream, but the kit remained a nightmare. If I had a colour television set, I wouldn't want anything else for the rest of my day. Oh. It was something like maybe four or five months' earnings. You promised me you were going to buy me a new one. I said when we can afford it. I think that maybe the more affluent people could see the value of colour and they wanted to be early adopters and be down the pub and say, well, I bought a colour TV. In fact, a lot of people opted to rent with colour TV initially, and hence the rental market developed accordingly. And of course, there were things like slot meter rentals, where literally a meter was hung on the back of the TV, and people would put their shilling in to get maybe an hour's viewing. It's a television! This is the life. The old fire gun, comfortable chair, coloured television. What more could you want? I mean... Showing Steptoe and Son's edition about colour TV and black and white was no sophisticated joke, just economics. We simply didn't have enough colour cameras. It sounds extraordinary now, but I think the number of, cam of colour cameras in the country was like a dozen or something. So we couldn't, to begin with, uh, launch a fully colourised service. It was also part of the policy that we wouldn't put a programme on that only made sense in colour. Even snooker, a sport brought to television purely to show off colour, was expected to remember older sets. We made orders, we, we instructed the commentators that they had, to, they had to make it clear as to what the balls were, which produced that famous thing, which I thought actually was a joke, but, I, but it really is true that Ted Lowe or someone said, and now he's going to go for the green, and for those viewers who don't know which the green ball is, it's next to the blue ball. For those of you in black and white, it's the green over that button bucket that he's looking at. Gradual disappearance of black and white television changed forever the way that programmes were watched and made. But to some producers, almost everything on the screen in the late 60s looked one colour, golden. And there are those who demand that pop music is nothing but the grotesque mumblings of a drug-sodden youth. Others, that it is making possible the most startling artistic upheaval since the Renaissance. During one of our hot numbers, I gave them instructions to mutilate the doll. Pop music is the classical music of now. We envy the television of the 60s, its freshness and specialness, and the almost total creative freedom of the people who worked in it. You get strange glimpses of the inhabitants of other planets traveling through space and time on a parallel course. They look like human beings, remarkably like human beings, in a lifeless polystyrene sort of way. But you're not going to tell me they've got souls. 
The phrase golden age is often used about that period of television. Did you regard it as such? It never occurred to any one of us. We just got on with it. We took it all for granted. <laughs> Knowing what has happened since, we wouldn't take it for granted. But I doubt whether we'd ever coin this phrase. I don't know who coined it. I think people were encouraged to explore new things, really encouraged to explore, encouraged to be different, um, encouraged not to um, copy programmes. Yes, can we please keep it quiet, studio? We're trying to camera rehearse. There were things that we would consider rubbish, but I don't think there were so many hours, were there? I mean, there, it wasn't wall to wall and going on all day and all night. So inevitably, the, there was probably less rubbish. I don't think we ever put out a program that was uh, that I was ashamed of. I mean, uh, there were some that, were, that weren't as good as they should be, of, of of course. But the but the ambition of every program was not to be ashamed of. The sixties was the great, the golden age of television drama. It was the age, of course, when you were introduced to us as a television playwright. Was it a golden age in your memory? It certainly didn't feel like a golden age. I don't think it is. I don't. I don't. I think it's too easy to confuse the kind of breakthroughs that were being made or secondary breakthroughs that were being made with, with a golden age. Harold Wilson, once television's golden boy and then its enemy, lost office at the end of the decade. But the medium had a final lesson for him about its independence and power in a BBC documentary marking the end of his administration. It was to be a uh, simply a television documentary. Harold was against it, and I persuaded him that you know we've got to make a start sometime of uh, getting back, and uh, this could be good for us. Really, we would not have taken part in a film that was entitled Yesterday's Men. That tells you everything about the programme. The thing that was wrong with the programme was the title, Yesterday's Men. If it had been called H. Wilson Recalls His Days of Power, everything would have been fine. What was perhaps a little irreverent was the, the music, and that was uh, added a little bit of a touch of irreverence. <laughs> this outtake footage, following a question from David Dimbleby about Wilson's income, shows the shift between political and journalistic power. It's a ridiculous question to put. Yes, and I mean it cut off. I don't want to read in, in the Times diary or Miss Elney that I asked for it to be cut out. All right, can, can, are you still running? Can I, can I ask you this, then, which, I mean, I... I let, let me put this question. I mean, if you find this question... I'm to ask then... if your curiosity can be satisfied. It's disgraceful. The, uh, we had trouble with the producer, uh, who could only continue making the film after I pleaded with the sergeant at arms because he was going to throw her out for the behaviour of her and her crew. They answered the questions. We didn't make them say anything they didn't say. We simply used their answers in a way they weren't used to, and I think that was what was different. I think you adjust very quickly. If you're in politics, you expect to have periods on the government side and periods on the opposition side. It was very unexpected, certainly to me, and I don't believe anybody who says they expected it. Oh, I think, yes, great humiliation. It was very unexpected. You know, that, that kind of uh, logic chopping is, is a disgrace. Yesterday's Men was the most disgraceful political programme ever broadcast by the BBC or any other organisation in this country. That poisoned relationships with the BBC for the next five years. But in hating and fearing TV, Wilson was unusual among 60s viewers. The era was a high point of hope and enthusiasm for television. The measure of the medium's progress during this decade is the story of two astronauts. In 1961, it had been a miracle to see live pictures of Yuri Gagarin on the ground in Moscow. That's one small step for man. By 1969, viewers had a live feed of Neil Armstrong's feet kicking up moon dust. 
Proper respect for 60s TV shouldn't encourage the delusion that it could or should be reproduced now. Technology always drives content. When bulky cameras and the cost of exterior filming meant that most drama was made in the studio, TV plays were a version of theatre and often written by the same people. Satellite technology, interactivity and 24-hour transmission result just as naturally now in I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. We shouldn't see these shifts in content as simply intellectual and moral decisions, but as the natural evolution of a medium which, unlike theatre, changes shape according to the culture around it. While some see the 60s as the time when the good programmes stopped, it should perhaps be seen as the period when the best TV of the future became possible. The 21st century is not simply tin, and the 1960s were by no means wholly golden. Well, that is all for the moment, I think. Anything else? Well, sorry about the mix-up earlier here on BBC Four. Technology can go a bit haywire even in the 21st century. We're back on track now, so stay with us. This really is panto for grown-ups. It was a phenomenon. It is both racist and it is also very patronizing. The Black and White Minstrels, tomorrow at 5 past 10 on BBC.